Jason Mock is CEO of Constant Canopy. He's obsessed with narrowing the gaps of agriculture. An apostle of relay cropping, Jason is blazing a new path using cash and cover crops in unison. One middle at a time, the Maverick Grower is uncovering clues and running wide open toward greater farming efficiency. Jason works 3,000 acres of corn, soybeans, and wheat, in addition to 25,000 hogs per year. His company, Constant Contact, is developing cutting edge farming methods and currently holds the Indiana state record for the highest yield per acre for soybeans and has developed scalable systems for corn yields that surpassed most high test plots. Jason, thanks for coming to Illinois country from the Hoosier land and kicking off our first Fielding Forward speaker. Let's give Jason a welcome to Illinois. Thank you. So there's a lot of questions in the air right now, right? You got how expensive is our nitrogen, our inputs. There's only so much we can do when we do exactly what we did last year. That, that creates adversity when we're not having some sort of action. And Mike Tyson had a quote, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And for myself, uh, I am kind of, I'm not new to farming. I've been around it my whole 42 years. I've helped. Uh, but I had a, uh, a catastrophe happen with my family in 2010. So this is, I'll, I'll come back to that point. This is who I farm with still today. That's my grandpa Mock there on the left. He's 88 years old. And that's his dad, Harley. And then the other side of the family, I had Papa Lou. So he farmed. 3,000 acres, and he was kind of this maverick in my, my uh, introduction uh, back in the 70s and 80s. He, he really was into ridge till, and he went into narrow rows, and he was always going to the shop and trying things. My father really did the same thing as well on our family farm, but I really like this picture. This is 1954. This is at a GM plant, and you see both grandpas in this picture. You know, this was the evolution of Henry Ford's idea of making a man's hands 10 times more valuable with technology and assembly line. And he could pay a guy a lot more if he amplified his ability to create value in the course of a day. The problem was Muncie, Anderson, Marion, where I'm from, was built on this idea of manufacturing. And in the 70s and the 80s, we kind of had that whole economy crumble in our backyard. And the way that I find Muncie Meats on Google Earth now is I find a big white spot on Google Earth. That's where the Chevy factory used to be over about 160 acre patch. And that's right next to Muncie Meats. It's kind of, kind of sad when we f reflect, uh, but at the same time, when we prune things, it creates opportunities for other things. This is my grandma Heaton. I really got the love from gardening from her I remember those catalogs with the green beans and the burpees, whatever it was, and she just put that catalog to life in her garden. She'd have raspberries as big as your thumb because she would steal the horse crap from the barn and put it underneath the raspberry bushes. That was her secret there. This is my father. This picture says a lot. He would just put me on the cow and I would just figure it out. And that's kind of the mentality. You can read till you're blue in the face. You can, you can hear people like myself, but until you go out and you do things, you know, uh, progress is failure plus reflection. So you gotta, gotta have this vicious cycle of we're gonna try things at a small scale, at a cheap scale, we're gonna learn, we're gonna do things a lot of different ways, and then the next year, we reflect and we redesign uh, from there. So that is who else I farm with, my father, he, he got pancreatic cancer in 2010, and in 2011, I was a man that had to figure out how to farm exactly what he did. Uh, I, I did exactly what he did. I planted the corn crop, I sprayed, and I really had to learn from the Hefty Brothers, from other people, how to farm in 2011. Uh, the problem was, was I came from a marketing degree, a landscape contracting business in town, so the, my lens was a lot different than some of the farmers in the area that was accustomed to farming their entire lives. So I, I've helped, but it also was, made me weird, if you will. 
So these are some of the things we're working on today. The stock cropper, and that's my kids there on the left, just being themselves. Well, we're going to be dead in 100 years anyway, so live dangerously. Mike Leach, if you're not familiar with him, he did pass a few weeks ago. I love that man. He was a, a great man of perspective. And, uh, you know, that's the case. Uh, everything is in a cycle. I'm really am fascinated with patterns. We really get into the numbers. We really get into consultation about, you know, do we need to plant 38,000 corn plants in the muck bottom and 29 on the top? And we can go in and out about how we do one thing the best way, but adversity makes all that data skewed, you know? So when we start looking at patterns, it becomes really valuable when we start designing multiple entities. And I'll, and I'll go into why I think multiple entities creates this resilience. So this is right outside my house. This is my favorite tree. This is just an old 150-year-old oak tree. And if I would cut that thing down, I better pack my lunch for the next month because it's going to take forever for me to change all this tree up. Now, if we would take that same tree when it was born and put it in the forest, it would have a completely different environment, it's a completely different set of circumstances. It would now have to compete with the other trees. It wouldn't have a trunk set down low. It wouldn't have massed this much biomass because it wouldn't have had the CO2, the sunlight, the water, the nutrients, all the stuff that this tree has enjoyed for 150 years to get to this spot. You also notice the shape. You look to the west on the left, and then up front, that branch coming at you, it almost comes to my house. So that branch up front extends over 100 feet from its base. So if you, I just snapped this as I was coming in today. These are two trees at the entrance of this hotel. If you look at that bigger tree on the left, Look how much more biomass is on the left side. That's because it's on the west and south side. It's collecting light, more light than the right side. The right side's gonna be steep and doesn't have quite the branches and nodes. Same thing on the other tree. It is a pattern, pattern recognition. You see this pattern all throughout nature. You see it in weather systems that get really cranked up. They create this pattern. You see it in their galaxies. You see it in seashells. It's nature's design is designed to either survive and kind of protect itself or thrive and really grow quickly. It's gonna keep that same pattern. And everything in nature is fractal. So the big pattern is the same as the smaller pattern and it's patterns within patterns. Weird, right? So uh, about 2015, I started uh, putting things on Twitter, and my wife told me I was doing it all wrong. I'm not supposed to make videos. I'm not, no one's going to care about me out in my field making these long videos. Well, I found out that if I continue to be weird, more people would say, hey, this guy is doing things differently than other people, and I just continued to uh, make videos in the field. I started doing chalk talks, and it, it, what it did was challenge myself for when I'm doing things on the farm to think about content for the next day. And it's, it's constantly being in this loop of challenging yourself is what creates that change. So that's, this farm weird has allowed other farmers to do different things on their farm, and it's created a platform for us to learn from each other. Because your soil is gonna be different than my soil. I spoke in Washington State a few days ago, and they only get six inches of rain per year. So when I'm up here talking about 46 inches of rain per year, we're not going to do the same thing on our ground, but we can think about these principles a little bit differently and how they would imagine using that on their farm. Also, we have field days, so I kind of get cross-checked, if you will. When I have people invited to my farm, they can come out and see what I am talking about on Twitter. Uh, here's a picture from three or four years ago. You see my relay beans to the left with the wheat strips. And if you look to the right, you can see monocrop beans. And it just takes a two or three or four inch rain all at once. And how many of you have seen a really good looking crop look like crap in three or four days? Why does that corn turn yellow or beans turn yellow? They just can't breathe. I just, the, the soil becomes uh, sealed off and the, and, the, and the roots need oxygen. And what this demonstrates here is having another crop creates the aggregates in the soil, the living roots, to unlock nutrients and do a lot of good things for another crop. 
but it takes experimentation to understand when something is either a competitor or a complementer. And you have to start changing the variables with seeding population, spacing, nutrients, and how we do that. So the last seven or eight years, I have been working specifically on wheat and soybeans, and then it's kind of progressed to other things, other designs, and other businesses as well. So I spoke of my landscape contracting background from the age of 24 to 29. I built uh, a landscape business that would go down to Indianapolis, in Muncie, Anderson. And uh, what I did, I, I would advertise using this thing called living billboards. So if I got a hotel, a nursing home, something like that, I really owned the curb appeal of the property. And the way that I would make it uh, prettier than anyone else is I would think over the course of the whole season. So I want something to bloom in March. That would be your crocuses and your daffodils and your tulips and your pansies are coming off. Then I would come out and I, since both sides of my family were farmers, I am inherently very cheap. You know, I just don't want to spend money just to spend it. Uh, so I could buy flats of flowers, 64 flowers for seven or eight bucks from the wholesaler if I would buy them before everyone else because that flower would get bigger and then someone would come into the store in May and buy it for 10 times as much for that bigger flower. So I would interplant my summer plants inside those crocuses and daffodils and pansies and then get a little bit of growth and it did a couple things. That plant would be in the ground longer so it would get bigger in the summer. It would also root down so I wouldn't have to go out there and have the variable cost of watering these plants that I plugged in the ground in June and then I get no rain and heat. Uh, so it served a purpose, but it also opened my mind to different shapes and sizes, expressions, colors, and how I could design these sequences so they would bloom throughout the course of the year, always have color. If you look at this here, you got you know, your petunias up front, you got this big dusty miller. There's only three of them, so that plant right there maybe cost 15 cents because it was really tiny. And then I've got cannas in the back that I go down to a grandma's house four miles down the road and she always stores her cannas and I, I just act like a dumb country bumpkin every year and she gives them to me. But putting these plants right here, I maybe have 15 bucks in it, but I know as time progresses, I'll be at a certain spot. So it allowed me to understand shapes. So you look at this picture, I still don't know where it is, somewhere out west, it's got mountains in the back, but you look to the left, that is wheat. The best wheat you can grow, right? Six inch spacing, seven and a half inch spacing. What you, I see is a linear sun capture. Now, on the right is lavender. It grows differently, but it's not that lavender wouldn't grow linearly if we planted in narrow spacing. It's because of the gaps in between. And what we do is we create genetic expression. And then we create different shapes. So if you look at this linear sun capture 100%, right here we create a shape similar to half pi, 1.57, but it's 1.618. Going back to that shape of the tree, striving out to get that southern and west sun exposure and CO2, the same thing happens in nature. It's iterations is, is the relevancy of sunlight and nutrients. So it's gonna stretch out further on the left side towards the sun, and then it's gonna be steep on the right side, just like the tree, and that creates 1.618. The beauty in the math of using multiple entities here is now we can create a shape. Instead of flat, we create a shape of 1.618. So now I can just plant a third or a half of the ground floor, create this shape in the form of a plant, and now have wheat heads or multiple corn ears or whatever on that plant. I empower the plant, but the value now is in creating the time and space to get something else started. Because you can't replace time. You can put your combine in your barn, go out to the bar, come back, your, 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 your barn's on fire, you call your insurance agent, get another combine. You don't want that to happen, but, but you can't replace time. And eventually through time, we figured out the spacing to not inflect much pain on the soybeans. So in 2015, my first year, we planted twin row wheat. We have a lot of fertility on our farm from our hog manure and just grandpa taking care of our land. The wheat would close its canopy and I had these little spindly beans. 
So it took three years for me to widen these rows out so I could get to a position where I have soybeans planted early, deeply rooted, just ready to party, just ready to grow big and yield quite a bit. I had to figure out, because I got hit in the mouth, my experiment didn't work, I needed to change my plan. So that's why we went to this schematic. Now, same thought process there when I go back to this picture. Not only do I have linear sun capture, but my wheat is going through senescence and dry down mode July 15th, July 21st. Can anyone know, tell me what is important about June, sorry, I said July, June. What's important about June 21st? Longest day. Longest day, that means it's our most valuable day. So we are spending our most valuable days drying down a crop so we don't have to run it through the dryer. And then if I want to plant beans, I got to go out here July 4th, July 6th, plant my beans. I have a dead zone in our most valuable days from June 15th to July 15th because it's going to take a rain, the seed to come out, sprout, and to start photosynthesis. And I'm starting photosynthesis on a very small portion of my land. So getting in a position like this, I can have compromise. And there is value in the compromise. When we look at our cost, when I talk about 39,000 corn plants and 221 units of nitrogen and all this stuff, the script, what happens if I plant 5,000 corn plants or 10,000 corn plants? Am I going to get one seventh of the yield? No, because that plant is gonna be like that first tree. All the leaves are gonna be viable. It's gonna take that sunlight energy and it's gonna make two or three or four or five Ears. So the math is never what I should do with A and what I should do with B, which was my thought process six, seven years ago, seven years ago. It is what is the best for A, B, or A, B, C, or you can continue on. So also, my mindset being a landscaper, I am never comfortable with bare dirt because bare dirt means weeds. It means water hemp, it means dandelions growing, it means whatever. So I am comfortable with canopy. If I can get grass to canopy, then I don't have to spray it. If I can keep it healthy, I might have to spray the edges, and it really lowered my cost. So I'm going out here planting all these cheap flowers early, I'm growing my grass tall, so I just spray the outside, and all I care about is that a place looks really good. So then once I lower my cost of my management, I can manage hundreds of acres of turf, you know, 50 businesses with five people if I'm not going out and just going through motions that aren't needed, if you will. So also, when you're doing this kind of stuff, you start thinking about multiple crops and their attributes. So this is something we do in wheat. When we apply manure, we have all kinds of weed pressure in the form of purple henbit, chickweed. If I just leave it open, I've got some monster chickweed that's just gonna wrap everything up in the spring. What I can do is plant my wheat and throw radishes, turnips, something, oats out there, and it'll take that energy and the fertility, grow a big leaf, and then that will block the ability of an invasive weed to come in. And I know that these specific crops will capture those nutrients, hand it off to the cereal that's going to green up, and I know it's going to die with a frost. So we have all of these seeds to our disposal. We can pick different ones, place them in different ways, to create more value. Also, when we figure out things like crimping rye, and we can take care of the weeds, if we can get multiple crops out there, we can get the canopy quicker. So if my rye is gonna last, I crimp it, and I've got six or eight weeks before weeds would come through that, I can use something like sweet corn and pumpkins into that algorithm, and now have you pick, or people coming out to pick that and create more value in two different parts of the season. So this is the pattern, this is 1.618, and this shows you the value of time equity. So if you go inside that swirl, that's where your one and your one is. It's the sequence, so one plus one equals two, two plus one equals three, three plus two equals five, eight, 13, 13 plus eight. It continues to create more and more value. So when I think in the context of crops, I've got this wheat spaced out now that it can sprawl out and grab more sunlight. So if I start another entity, 
I started that swirl, and that swirl is happening while the other crop is growing, while the other crop is expressing, while the other crop is getting the most out of life because I put it in a venue for it to thrive. Now you see we don't have a stopping point. We've got the senescence of the wheat or cereal, whether that's wheat, barley, rye, whatever it is. It's going through senescence while the other crop is just really hitting that point where it's producing more. So this is the prune play. See bogey here. We prune the wheat, and by getting rid of that biomass and stomping it down with the combine, now we create a new venue where it actually helps the soybeans. Because if I get that big two or three or four inch rain, the wheat helped the soybeans living right next to those roots get oxygen, consume some of the water, create a different, better environment for my summer crop. But now that it's gone, I open up light. My beans are, they're no longer have the motive to grow up and compete with the next bean to, next to it. That's why that tree was so skinny on the right side, not much biomass. You can actually create competition within one plan, if you will. Same thing on beans. You got all these tall beans competing in the summer, then you get that downdraft thunderstorm, and then they, they blow down. Now, if we space them out, they're going to grow out. So each node has a branch that's going out, collecting this light, and then bringing it back towards the center of the plant. And eventually, through two, three, four, five weeks, that plant will consume all of that space, all of that carrot. If you think about thriving, you know, I can choose not to do any of these experiments and I can be in my safe spot, right? But thriving is that carrot. And everything in nature is going to thrive if there's opportunity. Doesn't matter if this is a bean or, or something else. So eventually that'll close. And you're probably wondering, how do we harvest this? So this is that crop where we had over 100 bushel soybeans inside the wheat. Now, this was a little extreme, and I've chosen not to do this again. <laughs> we installed the wheat with our manure tanker. So my thought process is I've got fertile ground, and I'm paying a dragline guy a penny a gallon to apply this manure on ground that doesn't really need it. So let's put the manure in a manure uh, injector, and I'll plant my wheat right above a low-rated manure application. The wheat will grow for next to nothing, I planted about one-eighth of the wheat seed. It kind of stimulates the soil, and then I get these attributes later. And this was year four of the experiment. So we're not getting much wheat, but we don't have much cost in the crop. And now you can see these reflective solar corridors that we're creating. And you see some of this green coming into the combine. You wouldn't want to do this, or you'd probably have a heart attack or an aneurysm or something. This was a scenario where we had late planted wheat, a cold April, a hot May, it made the beans taller than wheat. That usually doesn't happen. But we have phenomenal soybean yields that year. So this is kind of the sequence that we kind of go to year after year now. Uh, we drill our wheat in 60 inch Centers, we plant four rows. So you got seven and a half, seven and a half, seven and a half, seven and a half. It makes it 22 and a half inches wide. You got a 37 inch gap between there. Uh, with my cobbled together planter here, I plant the beans about 10 inches inside the edge row. I've got about 41 inch gap over the wheat, 19 inch twins. And you can see my planter here. I've done it many different ways. I can actually cross plant it as well like this if need be, if I want to get across acres, this is my manure tanker wheat seeder. And then this is a machine that we designed with Don Equipment three years ago that uh, strip tilled and mixed the wheat and fertilizer with biochar and kind of uh, put it all in a strip. I really do like this design. Uh, my problem is I am just on a shoestring budget, so I'm trying to figure this out thinking, okay, in 2025, 2030, this will be mainstream and I'll have all this research into it. So we kind of cobble along two or 300 acres now, which makes it manageable. And then eventually we'll invest in quicker design here. This is the progression of that wheat. See how big that went from this point here. You see little wheat right here. 
So in just three weeks, it goes from being right next to where I planted it to this massive plant that is stretching out and getting as much sunlight and CO2 as possible. So I've really had to mess with the variables of different population and spacing and how wide the weed is and soybeans to figure out that I've got a plant that will be, that will strive 15 or 20 inches from the side of the row and this is kind of where I need to be. It also makes it easier for that combine traffic being 120 inches and that gap, I can run my combine traffic throughout there. Fractal nature, so if I rip a plant out and the whole row is doing this, then each individual plant is going to follow that pattern. But that also shows you the plant expression that is one seed that had a little bit more space and a wheat seed can have 30 or 40 heads on it if the population is low enough. So this is a picture of inside of that wheat that's really growing vigorously. And you can see the soybeans just inside enough to accept that light and grow well. But just imagine if you got a field like this compared to a field that only has the soybeans. If you only have the soybeans and you get a four or five or six inch rain, then there's nothing to help to dry out that soil. There's nothing that's going to, to create the aggregates to get the infiltration. And we're pretty flat around here. I have a little bit more hills. If I've got a little undulation, I get a big rain, it's all gonna go right to the cent or to the bottom, and then my tile's gonna pump it out. If I've got this going on, I will accept the rain on the sides of the hills. So if I get that three inch rain, it stays here. So I'll have that moisture with the thatch and the carbon in the soil come summertime because it was collected earlier. So then the wheat goes through this time frame here where the heads come and it actually straightens back up. So that space that allowed the light earlier, now it straightens back up. So now look at the leaves of the soybeans and it's very important if we think about how that soybean is going to grow. So everything in nature has a brain, whether it's an animal, us, a plant. It's figuring out how many viable seeds to make, it's figuring out how to grow. And it's very important that the soybean is is, is going, is staying low. It's, it's very important we plant them early so it's not real hot when it's going through these growth stages and we're creating a venue for high yielding soybeans. See, we go through senescence and then look at that shape now compared to that linear design. We've got the wheat stretching out. Now we have an equity going back to that sequence. One, one, two, three, five. That's four sequences. If I go five more days or hours or months, whatever that time progression is, I'm at 55. So the sequences that got me the first, I'm at five, five later, I'm at 55. So that shows you how important it is to get things started. So the same thing, no matter what it is, whether we're trying with crops or starting a business, nothing is gonna happen overnight. It's going to be pain, <laughs> reflection, progress. It's a vicious cycle and it, it sucks sometimes, but you have to go through it to learn and you have to get through it to get more value. So this is just a, a split. It's very similar to compound interest. So if we, if we create a venue for that plant to put the, put the trunk out or a branch out early and more branches on top of that, I'm gonna have a lot more in my bank account like Warren Buffett if I started investing when I'm 20 versus when I'm 65. And we know that math there. So also I get a lot of comments about trashy farming. What are the beans gonna do with all this trash? And if you go by here and you sit out there and drink a Dr. Pepper and watch me combine, you might just shake your head because you don't know how the beans are gonna survive. And then the next day it's like they just shake off all the residue and they're, they're green again. But these are the pads up close. We've done some changing on that. The first we had two pads and now I redesigned it to have one to go inside of this thicker wheat and then this pushes up that thatch up against there and I get a really nice tight kind of Ziploc seal to protect those soybeans that way. So right there, I am combining in the field. I did the inrows the day before and you can see all that trash is shaking off and falling down and now I have beans just ready to really grow in every single direction. So think about that as well. If I'm competing and I can only grow up and now I can grow in all directions, 
then I am empowering the entire plant. So every single node is going to be producing pods. You kind of go through a sequence in monocrops where the lower part of the plant now is in the shade, so you're going to get your blights, your white molds, your all kinds of disease. So there's other attributes as well, not only the moisture side, the, the plant growth side, is the wind flow. The wind going through there, I am accepting all this carbon dioxide through the plant. I'm also drying that dew off in the morning. So the lower crop canopy in a, a normal tight design might be wet from dew till noon or one, which creates that disease. If I can dry that off, I might be able to lower some of my inputs like fungicide. So we're designing the uh, traffic. This is what it looks like after harvest. And then this is just that power play that I alluded to. All these plants. And this is the, the results that you see. Uh, that picture earlier, we had the double crop beans. This is in early September. We'll get six, seven, eight nodes because we're not even getting to bloom to August. And you talk about June 21st, and now we're in August. We're six or seven weeks past the longest day. The plant is smart enough to not keep, it, it's not going to grow like if we planted it earlier. So you just get a, a limited amount of nodes, a limited amount of pods, and then you need a gazillion seeds out there. So I got to call my seed guy and hopefully he gives me free seed. If I have to pay for it, I'm planting 220,000. Literally, if I plant three or 350,000, it's probably going to help my yield. I need as many minions out there as possible because I'm not going to get much production per minion. Then I Compare that to the monocrop bean here. I usually get 14, 15, 16 nodes. The bean is sprawling out and getting sunlight down low earlier. Then I get a, a big spacing in my nodes as it's competing with one another. And then having those beans spaced out, you're going to get multiple branches. And then you're going to really condense those nodes because they are growing out, bringing that energy back in. So you don't need as many plants. So going back to that math. If, if I am, instead of looking at how to grow the best crop, instead I am saying I want to manage my sunlight, CO2, and water, then I don't want the best wheat crop. And if I don't want the best wheat crop, maybe I only plant three or 400,000 seeds instead of 1.8 million seeds. So instead of 100 bucks, I got 20 bucks in that. Maybe I only put... 60, 70 units of nitrogen out there because I don't want this vigorous crop that's going to consume all my water because beans are worth $15 a bushel and wheat is worth seven or eight or whatever your other crop is. You want to figure out the A-B scenario from an economic standpoint on the inputs and then the aggregate outputs. How do I move this up here and I move this down here? It's through compromise and through design and through more days of living roots and photosynthesis. And if you really want to go out there and search, you can find a bean plant with 1,000 pods if you ran it over with a combine or something like that. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing math if you give it time. So those are the kids later. That's in the same exact picture if I go back here as right there. So that's that field, July 7th, 8th, 9th, something like that. It's going through this progression. And then it's filled back in. And I've got these really mean beans. And I've got wheat that I planted really thin that I don't have much cost in that I can get. Here I had 80 bushel wheat and 70 bushel beans. So you do that math when, when that cereal price is up. Now I can start thinking about my herbicide program. If I don't have to defend thinner soybeans, if I got fer fertile ground, I'm going to plant 100, 110,000 soybeans so they don't lodge. Well, I got water hemp. I got all this stuff coming on, and I get this really quick convective temperature with my soil. So if I got full sun, it's baking my hot, black, good old Illinois soil, and I get that soil hot, I trigger mare's tail, water hemp, all this stuff that I got to talk to my chemical guy, continuously layer down chemical, the best stuff to kill this stuff, when if I would use another crop and expedite canopy closure, I can use the cheap stuff. I can just spray a residual in 2,4-D on early, and that canopy is going to take care of me, and I'm not going to have much weed pressure later. It, it really is. It's weird to try weird things and then actually get a comfort level from it. Because I know my plants are not going to choke out and die or become anemic or turn yellow. They're going to be vigorous. If I manage my wheat in a conservative way, my weed control is easier, 
And yeah, there's still certain things we're figuring out. I get some volunteer weed in there sometimes that slows you down, but it's not. It's actually a good thing, but it's just a little different. But we have continued to expand our acres and get more and more comfortable with this system. And this field actually here was a neighbor's field that he wanted me to just try it with that machine. So we had one year where we went around with that machine and tried it at different farms. And just to get out of the context of my farm with more manure uh, fertility. And you just see the difference there. It just takes a few weeks and we're zipped back shut. And do you see a weed there? It's, it's just easier. And then also, you, do you see any yellow spots or anything like that? It, I mean, it, it really does mitigate our water risk. So this is Eric Miller, if you know him on Twitter. He's beginning uh, twin 60-inch corn. So 60-inch corn to get the same amount of plants. You got them pretty close. They're kind of, the roots are running into each other. So that same thought process was diamond pattern. And twins, we can take 60-inch corn and get that five or six inch plant spacing. All the leaves now can collect light. And what he's doing is he is putting 17 species of cover crops in between and he's creating his own nitrogen. So same thought process. I made space with my shape, my spacing for wheat, for soybeans. Can I grow my nitrogen in between my corn row and then flip it back to that center spot the next year? And now when I call my fertilizer guy, my order is smaller. And he says, well, what's going on? Well, I tried, tried this new thing. Don't do it across your whole farm, but this is very interesting to do on an acre or two, five acres the next year. I think there'll be a lot of growth in that thought process. So I've also messed with corn and soybeans. I've tried the rows. The corn is too tall. The beans stretch. Met a man named James Bates in 2018. He was a plant breeder in Hawaii, and he thought of this a whole different way. He saw his plants really shut down in the heat of the afternoon. So what if we put a structure up, whether it's a cardboard box or a plant, and we change the shadows created onto that understory? And I think that's where the math is in corn and soybeans with Pivot Bio, with biochar, with starter right on the seed. When we go back on that curve, we could plant four or 5,000 ears of corn, get 100 bushel yield. Yes, that's right. Each plant will yield three or four times more if all the leaves will collect light. And then I don't have much of an inflection point on the ground floor. The problem is you have to separate the seed, which the technology is there. It's just coming. But I did a uh, demonstration on Twitter where I took a flashlight and my kids' Legos and you move that flashlight and the shadows change. And that happens every day. Sun comes up, moves up throughout the course of the day. The shadows will change. So if I'm a plant on the ground floor and it's hot, I really like it when that cloud comes over, overhead. But it's not a cloud. It's pre-designed corn that is flexed. So we've done that in a lot of experiments. And in 2017, my kids are seven and eight now, my oldest was potty training. It's really easy to potty train them when it's hot out because they can just be half naked anyway outside. And we took an 1197 corn plant, put it in the garden. I put as much space as this table is away where anything would block its light. And I had my two-year-old at the time just pee on this corn plant every day. That was his job, target practice. <laughs> just knock it out, get her drenched. And we watched this progression where this corn plant said, hey, I got all this light, the CO2, I got this little kid peeing on me. I'm going to make a sucker. And it made two suckers. And then the suckers grew. And then about July 4th, I noticed all these corn plants growing on every single node of the suckers and the plant. Those were ears coming out. The ears came out, and the ears grew leaves themselves. So you see all these big leaves are on the corn. And you'll notice that if you go to the edge of the corn and it's facing south or west, you're going to have these little leaves that grow on your, your corn plant because it knows it's got more value there. And that's why if you would check that row, it would be 100 bushel better because it gets more of the good stuff. Well, if you got good stuff all around, then it's good stuff all around. So the leaves would grow on the ears, and then another ear would grow on the, on the ear. So it had, anyone guess how many ears we had on this corn plant? 10. That's what I thought. That would be the max. 31. 
And a lot of them were down at the base. But at 31 total, the problem is we got a mail. We only got so much mail donation going on. So we can only get about 10 or 12 of them that had viable, a good viable grain head. And some of them had a couple of speckles. So much, so much pollen can go on. So you don't want to mess with the math too much in that direction because then you're wasting space. But how do we rewind up that curve and get so many plants out there and help that out? So we did a, a study, and Zach has done a study where we put gaps in the plants. So you might have two or three ears of corn that have three or four or five ears on them, and then you have a big gap. And then you have corn over here, kind of staggered. And you can mess with it, but the problem is it's a pain to separate. I just know this will be a thing someday because we're creating nitrogen you know, with the soybeans and so on and so forth. So it's kind of fascinating doing the math here. So you see this in a curve here. As we push wheat yield, this being the blue line, as we push it towards 100%, we inflect a lot of pain on the other entity. So if we go back here and we only have, say, 20% of the seeding rate as the wheat, we can still get 60% of the yield. Same thing with the corn. And we inflict hardly any damage. Or with those 108 bushel soybeans, when we got a big rain, we created a better environment and solar reflection and a different venue. So we actually increased the other entity. So messing with all these variables, you, you create this inflection expression map. There's two entities. You know, we, can, we can go on from there. So you do this five or six years, you, you, see, you get kind of bored, I guess, and you start thinking about what if we start putting animals out in our crops? Because I got 12,000 hogs, we're pumping poop to the same field because I have an umbilical cord that goes two or three miles. What if I want to put livestock here and then what if I own the livestock? Can I market them at a higher value by sharing the story from day one? So we look at the math of this when you start doing four and four. The idea with a stock cropper in a corn context is you plant corn differently. So you plant them really thick on the outside rows, thinner on the middle, tall hybrid. We create that shape. You see the 1.618. And then we put our animals in between. We grow a cover crop that's palatable, that will support the life of cattle or sheep, put pigs in there and chickens, and we train them back and forth. So we were thinking about this, and so let's just do it. In 2020, the year of COVID, we found some real estate that I could rent the house out for $1,200 a month. And the whole note on the property was $900, and I got a 10-acre pasture that I could convert to organic. So we just started this schematic. And I made 14 of these little chicken coops and sheep alcatrazes. We had two interns. And we would go out there two or three times a day. And we would move the livestock in between the cover crop, in between the crops. And that's what they would do. So they would combine this C4 grass down to the stems. And then you give this a few days. And the sheep and the chickens all pooped on it, and it just grows back vigorously. So you kind of create this ratchet effect where the cover crop or grass gets thicker and thicker and more and more biomass. It opens up the lipids and gets more, more energy for the animals. But we are empowering the popcorn on the side. You see all these leaves collecting light. So I got two or three popcorn ears per plant. And I got all these chickens. We started with meat chickens, now we're doing egg layers, because we can put them out here, and then we got two or three more years out of the animal producing eggs. So we made these little sheep alcatrazes. We started with uh, electric wire, and we figured out we couldn't shock them through the wool. So then we made these things, and then eventually they got mad, and a couple of them would get out, and then they just turned psychotic where they were all out, and I didn't really care. <laughs> the corn is already up. So if we think about risk mitigation, it's very important to think about this scenario. Yes, doing some crazy things out here, but I had a house that I was renting. It was covering my egg. And then I just got some cover crop seeds in this. I had some money in that. I had some interns from the university come out that were intrigued on all this crazy stuff. And we just cobbled together all this stuff. And it does seem weird and risky, but at the end of the day, it's not risky because we're learning and we're, we've got a platform to tell people about things, and they're trying things. So this is Zach. So this intrigued Zach to do his own thing in Iowa. 
he got out the welder and he made this obscenely heavy stock cropper uh, there that you see behind him that had sheep up front, pigs in the back, and then this is his chicken behind. It kind of created an algorithm where the, the sheep and the pigs, they trample down, they poop, and then the flies come in, and then the larva is born about 72 hours later, and we're trying to make like protein mix for our chickens in a weird way going through there. So we got together with, I introduced Zach with Joe Bassett, my friend from previous ex experiments with Don Equipment, and we made an autonomous stock cropper because we can only have so many interns and we all get older and our back hurts in the morning when we're dragging all these chickens around. So what if we take solar energy, an inverted roof, so when it rains, it fills up the water, there's solar pads up top, and it moves autonomously between your crops. Economically, it's pretty tough in corn because corn is cheap, but my idea, my value proposition was this, is to grow perennial food crops where we're going to invite kids, Down syndrome, special needs, older people. We're going to plant raspberries and blueberries and apple and nut trees in wide spacing, graze in between for three or four or five years through that time progression where I can buy that rootstock for next to nothing, and then it's a viable plant, and then I move this as training wheels to where I plant new plants. Does that make much sense? And then once, I, once everyone comes out and picks the raspberries and blueberries, we can run the pigs through there, get their nose stained in blue or red, and now I can sell raspberry-inspired pork. You know, kind of get a little weird on you there. But this was uh, that progression this year there. And we had a pumpkin patch right next to it. So when they went through here, do you think they didn't eat this pumpkin? They don't really care. If it's green, they'll eat it and they'll convert it. And then it tramples down and it just gets thicker and thicker and it's pretty neat. So I also have this on here, the slide. This was our garden. And this is something I'd like to do with community gardens. Just use rye as you talked, alluded to. Let that rye grow vigorously, then trample it down. And then I have a clean garden that I don't have to hoe. So if I have a community garden, I have a bunch of kids come out, we plant plants, we transplant them. They come to Saturday, they don't have to do the burden of rototilling between the rows and pulling weeds. They can talk about marketing their vegetables. You know, by pre-designing things, we can take out burdens that we normally have to do and convert them to create the space to try something else. The other cool thing about this right here, does anybody know what this is? Water hemp, pure water hemp. And I just kept it there and I let it grow all summer just for spiteful uh, told you so, to just see what the difference was. You know, same context, same fertility, without the rye, you have water hemp. That would, would require you to spend money and time and energy. So here's the three sisters, and you can see that mat reflecting the light. And my boy likes to go out there and bring stuff back, and he feels good about himself. So you figure out the principles, you can start doing different things like pumpkins and sweet corn. And then we start thinking about what we can do with the livestock in different landscapes. Uh, so other real estate transactions have, have had woods. The woods will be full of uh, understory of brush. And by running pigs through this understory, I give them about a week, 10 days, and they'll trample all this ivy down I bring in the chainsaw, any dead trees, we'll cut down, we'll make it into the firewood. And then they're a kuna matata in all day, so this down tree, they root out of the way and they just snort a line of maggots and grubs and they're just happy as all get out. And we reset the landscape on the ground floor. Taking those dead trees out, trampling it all down, the grass wouldn't have grown in that thick ivy but now that it can get light, it's got fresh pig poop and pee, I reset the pasture and I get grass. It's pretty neat. Yeah, it did take work, but I delegated that work to 50 pigs and all their hooves and, and you know, they just did their best for a week. I turned that into a machine, and then we turned that into pork. And the pork is really good. So I own a meat company now. We get a ton of meat in from Tyson. We see what a picnic looks like. And then we compare it to the pigs in the woods. The pigs exercise. They, they live slower. They eat nuts. 
It's just a marbled, nice piece, and then it's a very finite thing, so we only have so much of it, so there's kind of a competition to get it, so we elevate the value of it. So we're always talking about produce, 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 but we're just devaluing things. Sometimes it's good to be different, differentiate, create value. It's not going to support everything. Same mindset as corn and soybeans or wheat and soybeans. Have so much of this, so much of this, so much of this, and cover the bills and help develop those higher valued things as time progresses. So this gave the confidence of not only myself, but others to buy a bigger piece of real estate. And we're now developing a piece of real estate that moves animals around, grazes them, has the stock croppers. This is Monty Bottoms. This is a very interesting thing that he does. He'll move this sled behind the cattle with the cow-calf pairs. Instead of feeding them every mineral, you give the intelligence to back to the animals, and they will pick which mineral they're deficient in. Sometimes that's why you see pregnant women sometimes will eat chalk. Kind of weird, but they, are, they, are, they think that their baby needs a specific nutrient. So if you give them the bandwidth to choose themselves, you can extremely lower uh, the requirements uh, for grass-fed beef. This is his uh, design, no fence. So you put this on the mama cows, or you put it on one-tenth of the sheep, you graze them, and then you can move them on your phone. It, it trains them. Uh, through sound to move to different paddocks. And this is going to be very important when we look at like 60 inch corn. I shell the corn and now I have this huge block of land. Farmer B has all these mama cows. He comes out and he moves them all around in the course of a month. They clean up all the corn, they deposit their manure, and now I've got two really happy parties. And I think once we create the technology and the knowledge to have two separate interests work together to create value for each other, then I think this whole thing is going to explode. But it's going to be really tough if you're out there hammering posts in the ground and all that stuff. So we've got sheep out there. We've got sheep on the golf course. This was inspired by a, a club in Nashville. So anything that's not fairways, we've got sheep and food and just a different mindset. I have three greens. I have 18 tees, and I have these little navigational beacons. We have uh, cross-country meets, so on. But these are the holes. You got one this way, this way. And then we're going to add to these posts once we have the raspberries, blueberries, brewery, hotel, whatever. It's on an interstate. We're hoping to develop it. That's that. So Muncie Meats, we also are thinking outside the box somewhat. Uh, it's very tough to develop a retail, pay for a high, high-valued lease like on Neal Street. Yeah, that would cost you five or ten grand. Uh, these are called automated farmer's markets. So we have an e-commerce platform that we uh, really grow with fundraisers, with automated fundraisers. So we put our product in a lot of people's hands, then we promote this. And I'll show you a little video of how it works. This is one of the interns and about a $12 budget on Amazon for a loincloth. This is uh, Sam, our meat cutter. So people will go to MuncieMeats.com, they'll get a steak, smoked pork chops, sweet corn from Spangler Farms. It goes in a box, they roll right up to it. This machine sends that QR code to their phone, so they can literally just get out, pop it, and get back in their car in about 20 seconds. So all this weird stuff, with pigs in the woods, grazing, whatever, we want to collaborate with people and put these products in metropolitan areas where the consumers are and make it convenient for them. So the last two years we have been figuring out how to put big pieces of meat into small pieces of meat and add in value with patty machines and all that kind of stuff. That has grown and hopefully it will continue to grow as we go forward. I'm very, very inspired about closing this gap between we growing all this food and no one can buy your food. Uh, so one thing We've done, we've, we put, uh, this is Dick Johnson. He brings our diesel fuel out to the farm. He also owns Gasson and Matthews. We have another one, Eaton and Dunkirk. We're putting our product in the local gas station so you don't have to drive 20 miles into town to get high quality meat. I have a lot of friends pat me on the back. They love going to get a six pack of beer and a steak. It's changed their life a little bit. And I enjoy it too myself. But this is our automated fundraisers. We've taken the burden out of both 
the kids collecting money, and then the person with the fundraiser. Uh, we can have 10, 15, 20 of these going on all at once, and it's not about someone supporting Muncie Meats, it's about them supporting the basketball team. So the basketball team has a fundraiser, they have 50 boxes, we, we show up with a check for 25% of sales, they share that on social media channels, and we put our product in as many people's hands as possible because marketing begins with giving things away and then asking, how'd you like it? It's a lot easier that way than just selling and, and never actually trying that product out. So that's a big reason why I travel and do these kinds of things is the input that I get from you guys. So I appreciate it. So. Uh, Sometime in late June or early July, I'll have a field day at my farm. We will live combine the wheat, and then we have the Flying Buffaloes or some Nashville band that are really good come out, and we have some barley pops, and we just have a really good time because you only live once, right? So that's that. You guys are all invited. Look out on Twitter and the, and the face, Facebook and the tubes uh, for that. So... Anyway, I'll leave it at that for any questions, and thank you for inviting me here. <laughs>